Hi, and welcome to Lesson 5 of this Online Humanities class. Uh, what we'll be doing in this lesson is, as the title suggests, looking at the nature of art uh, within the modern era, or at least the way in which art evolves from the earlier pre-modern era into the modern era. What we'll also be looking at is uh, another text. We'll be briefly uh, examining the text of Vasily Kandinsky and we'll looking at, be looking a bit at the life of that artist, uh, his work on the spiritual in art, and we'll be examining some of his remarks from that book on the nature of modern art. It's a very interesting work. Um, it's very informative also, and it kind of reveals, well, what's happening with art? What, it is, what is it that art is doing? Now, initially, that might not seem like such a problem, but if we, for example, start by looking at uh, an interesting historical work of art, uh, the following, we can start to then raise the question, well, what is it that art is doing? Okay, there you see in, in, in the, the question, is this art? Uh, what you have here, uh, this is a was a submission by a famous artist, Marcel Duchamp, French artist. Uh, it's called The Fountain, or Fountain. It was submitted in 1917. As you see, the name on it is R. Mutt, uh, 1917. That's actually, this is, a, I, I believe this is a replication of it. Um, the original piece was lost, but the original piece was submitted uh, to an art show. Actually, Marcel Duchamp was, in fact, on the panel of artists who were presiding over the show. And he said, you know something, I'm going to submit this piece under a different name. And so he put our mud on it. And if you really look at it, what is it? What are you seeing right there, right? Well, it's, it's a urinal, in fact. And all it is is a urinal in which... Uh, Duchamp has written a name and a date on it, and he submitted it to the art show. Originally, the piece was rejected, even though the art show, according to the, uh, the criteria, all pieces would be accepted. Well, this one was rejected until they found out who it was, Duchamp, the famous artist, and then they kind of accepted it. Okay, And so what, what this brings to the fore is the issue of the nature of art and so you're kind of you have to ask the question well wait a minute you know if this piece was originally rejected until they found the, out who the artist was and thereafter it was accepted well this seems to say something very bad about the nature of art um, that's true in some ways because well art is for example a social phenomenon in some ways we create art at the same time however the submission here, the, the fountain, was really a groundbreaking piece uh, which leads to modern art because it indeed expresses something about the nature of art which over the many centuries was not yet really understood or well known to artists. So what you can say is that uh, on the one hand the submission kind of brings to the fore the fact that well in some ways we're creating art but at the same time it's showing that well this creative dimension uh, the fact that we create art we do create art but at the same time art kind of creates itself and there's a kind of objective realm or world within which art abides okay so now this this piece kind of brings in modern and even postmodern art the kind of art that you might be more familiar with today or maybe not like Okay, depending upon your perspective. Um, and what I'm going to do in this lesson is just go through some of the historical paths that um, art has taken, especially in painting, in which it leads in, it could then lead into something like this. Okay? In later lessons, we'll have the opportunity to talk about, well, what is this? You know, how is this, this particular piece art? Okay? Uh, we won't get that far within that, this lesson. Within this lesson, we'll get more into the modern version of art and how modern artists start to move away from something like physical images or forms that we all recognize like trees and people and into things like abstract lines and shapes etc and still call that art okay so we have to examine well what is that and what are they doing so let's get started here 
And we're going to start with early modern art, um, and especially with Impressionism, a kind of it's early or slightly pre-modern art. Uh, Impressionism, you could say in many ways, kind of is modernist, kind of brings in the modern era. And here we have a, a painting by Claude Monet, The House of the Parliament at Sunset. So this particular image is a good place to start because what we're going to look at is Impressionism, and that was an Impressionistic painting. Now, Impressionism, okay, originally, it originally it's most mostly in France, okay, later moves on into other areas, and it has less em emphasis upon socio-political scenes. Uh, so the way you want to start to think about art, okay, is if you consider neoclassical art, which we've already looked at, you saw that a lot of the images dealt with something like um, the society of the times, revol even with, you can, with romantic art, with revolutions, uh, you saw the French Revolution um, and scenes of suicide, you know, great political suicides or great political events. Well, what's going to happen is that as Europe and America starts to move into a new era where people are starting to move into the cities, starting to work in factories, where businesses are starting to open, so people are moving away from the rural life on farms, and starting to, to obtain an education on a larger scale, um, what's going to happen is that, well, society is going to kind of start to relax a bit. And because of that, well, people are just going to have more time, and they're going to start going out to eat, and they're going to start socializing at cafes, etc. And so artists are going to start to turn their attention more toward these everyday scenes, and so less emphasis on kind of these political uh, scenes will be seen in something like the Impressionistic works, okay? And that's what we're going to see there. Uh, what's also interesting, is, as a side note, is that a lot of the Impressionists are going to be influenced by Japanese prints and photography, which I'll briefly look at. So as I said, there's going to be more concern with everyday scenes, genre subjects like leisure, entertainment, landscape, cityscape. Um, and But what's really important uh, for the consideration of how the art moves into modern art is that the Impressionists, they start to dabble with the way they're painting, okay? So in other words, what happens is that these painters within the, the post-1848 era, the, the, the industrial era, they start to say, well, what is it that we're doing as painters, right? Do we need to paint scenes the way we see them? Can't we kind of add our own flair and touch to it, right? So today that might seem normal to paint something which is a bit more abstract, right? But during that time, that type of thinking was actually looked upon in a very negative light because, well, there was this whole idea that the artist should be uh, skilled in their art and should be representing images to the, in the best way possible. So what's going to happen, though, is that the Impressionists are going to start looking at something like optical, the optical effect of light and the natural properties of light. They'll be looking at something like color and how color changes the scenes and the weather. And they'll be examining something like shadows and reflections. And what they'll do is they'll start to use these optical effects within their painting and they start to, let's say, uh, bring these out in a more powerful way so that the paintings now reflect that kind of these optical properties rather than just the scene that you're actually looking at. Now what's going to happen is that these Impressionists, who will eventually become extremely famous later on, uh, even up, up to today, their paintings during their own time are going to be ultimately rejected by the mainstream uh, large art academies, which was the French Academy, and by the public. So people are going to, at the time, are going to see their works and say, just as you might look at the painting, we just, the, the, sorry, the sculpture, which, well, the modern art, the, the fountain, the urinal that we just looked at and say, and people would say, this is not art. These people are not painting actual scenes that you can actually uh, identify. They're, they're kind of, they're not even very skilled, it seems. They seem to be just messing around and playing and dabbling. Right, so the public is not going to be very happy with their work of art, with their work, because indeed their work is going to be something so new that people haven't really seen this. Uh, when we look at something like Kandinsky later on in his discussion of the nature of art, he'll talk about this novelty, this new type of art, 
uh, in his book. So the Impressionists, they'll join together as a group at the Café Gerbois in Paris. I've actually been at that café. If you go to Paris, you can go and walk around and see all the beautiful sights, but you can also go to that café and sit down and have a drink. It's a very nice place. So if you're ever there, make sure you go and, and visit the Café Gerbois. So they also held uh, their own art exhibitions because the Academy wouldn't uh, accept any of their paintings between 1874 and 86. And despite the rejection of their work, their art in fact led to the great historical influence on the nature of art and painting. So let's get started then. So here we have not an Impressionist work of art, but a Japanese woodblock, and I'm using this just to show you some of the influences that we're going to see from the Japanese art. Notice how the colors, okay, the color fields are a little different, the background, right? It's just a single color field, and you'll see even on the, the dress itself, this color, the color kind of stands out as a singular color with some blue and some orange, right? So the Impressionists are going to start looking at that and say, hey, look, they're not the Japanese there, they're not etching the, the colors as they actually see them. They're kind of interpreting it a bit, bringing out certain colors, leaving some open spaces, okay? So, so what's going to happen is they start to see this and they start to make use of it, okay? You see another example here of this, the great wave at Kanagawa by Katsushi, uh, Katsushika Hakusai, and it's from a series of 36 views of Mount Fuji. Again, notice how there's an emphasis on open fields of color. You see how the wave is rising up and that, that the white part of the wave, kind of the foam, is just given in a single blanket of white, right? So again, they're going to start looking like that. Here's another example, um, night view. Again, another woodblock print, and you'll see again that kind of minimalization of colors and the use of color. Okay, almost almost like a cartoon that you'd see today, but of course they didn't have that then, right? So let's get started with our first French impressionistic painter. <coughs> That's Edward Edouard Manet, and here we have a bar at the Folier Berger. So one thing you want to notice here first is that the use of color. So if you look at the painting itself and you look at, for example, in the background, you see the lights, okay, focusing, for example, I'll bring the cursor here, in the background there, the lights here and here. If you actually saw this in a museum, this paint, painting, you would see that the light there on, on, those, on those columns, it actually would shimmer from the painting. Notice also that the woman, okay, you have the emphasis on the light there, and in the background, notice how the man, the face there, is not painted realistically, okay? So Manet uh, himself, the painter, he was a very skilled artist, and he could have rendered the face of that man accurately within the, the mirror if had he wanted to. Also look at the background, too. But now his interest is not doing that. Rather, also the chandeliers, notice how the, there's an emphasis on how they're putting the oil paint on the canvas, an emphasis on how the colors are starting to sort of shimmer on the canvas and how the shadows start to work. So this is that first movement in terms of Impressionism. Here we have another painting by uh, Renoir, the Moulin de la Gale, and here we have an oil on canvas. Again, unfortunately, we don't see this the actual picture itself in the museum. But again, notice how the, the colors are all laid out, okay? There's kind of, and notice how there's an interest in the way in which the colors are placed on the painting, this kind of smooth marks, right, of color, and these kind of fields, tiny fields of color, uh, and also how the images themselves, there's not this interest so much in rendering an accurate picture as there is in showing the light and color, okay? So this is impressionistic. Okay. Another great uh, painter, one of, one of my favorites, is Edgar Degas, a dancer with a bouquet. So Degas would go into, into the theaters and he'd just put his, his painting, his easel down, and he'd just start painting. This was actually one of uh, another interesting uh, break from tradition which the Impressionists would make. In tradition, traditional painting, the painters would go out and with a sketchbook and they would sketch a scene or what they would do and then go home and sort of 
put together a very formal scene, put it together on a sketch, and then after that they have the sketch all set up, it's all formalized, and then they would paint the picture. Well, with the Impressionist, what they started doing is kind of what, what you see artists doing today. They would just take their easel and take their paints, they'd go outside, they'd find a scene, and they'd paint it on the scene, kind of impromptu. So this kind of impromptu painting style then starts to become very influential, as we all know, within painting, uh, even up to today. Okay, so again, notice the emphasis on color, these fields of green and the white there, and, the, and kind of orange. Okay, and also the, the movement toward more abstract images within, because there's less emphasis on physical forms itself, right? So here we have Claude Monet, one of the great French Impressionists. And notice that this picture, the forms are even more kind of uh, faded out. So, and here, if you could actually see the color of the sunset in a museum, you'd notice that actually those, that color would just shimmer from, from the canvas itself. A lot of uh, Monet's paintings are in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. If you ever have a chance, make sure you go. If you're in New York, make sure in New York City, make sure you go to that museum and check out Monet's paintings. They are absolutely stunning to see in person. Okay, so again, this kind of impressionistic move. Right. Here's another one by Monet. He would often paint um, uh, these kind of lily ponds. And again, notice this emphasis on how the brush strokes are applying the color there, right? And these fields, these fields of color where the form is being kind of diminished in preference for, for bringing out how the color and the light and the shade is going to be reflected off the canvas, right? So again, we have another one by Claude Monet. This is Rouen Cathedral. Um, again, that emphasis on color, the de-emphasis on form, and the, the emphasis on space and shadow, etc. Okay, so very impressionistic. Okay, so I'm going to move fast here, okay, because this is, uh, we just kind of want to get into the main points, which is going to lead us into uh, Kandinsky's discussion or within his book so we can understand it. Now, what we're going to do is make that movement to post-impressionism and from there move to abstract art, which will take us to Kandinsky, right? So post-impressionism. Now, uh, realism was a type of art that we didn't look at, but I could just talk about it here. Uh, realism was an art which kind of followed from neoclassicism and followed from romanticism, in which artists began to look at kind of real-life conditions and try to capture those conditions, okay? So what realism was concerned with kind of the... the realities of life with labor, hardship, urban, rural conditions, uh, with political scenes as well. And you see that sort of that realistic uh, emphasis upon images and scenes in the world is going to be de-emphasized within Impressionism because now the Impressionists are going to be more concerned with everyday compositions and formal, also with the style of, of, of painting the pictures just by going out and immediately seeing it and painting it. Um, they'll be interested in light and color and surface and shadow as well, right? So, so uh, here we have Renoir. This is now an, another example of Impressionism. And notice how with the Impressionists, we have that play of light on surface, okay? So we're going to move into the post-Impressionism and see how they start to change it. Again, another one from Degas, Impressionism, okay? Um, from Monet as well. Okay, still in the Impressionism, again from Monet. Now, in the informal compositions of the Impressionists, another point which I forgot to mention, were inspired by the use of photography. So, what's going to happen is that the Impressionists are going to see people making use of cameras, and they go outside, they, take, they set up the camera, and they take a picture, and they say, hey, wait a minute, they can just sit there and take a picture of what they're seeing, so why can't I just go out and paint something that I just immediately see? Right, and here's some pictures. Okay, and so notice here, an Impressionist painter, we have uh, Degas giving this kind of informal scene. He's sitting down in the bar, and he just paints some people sitting there, right? Now, the next generation um, will be the post-Impressionists, and this is a perfect example of a post-Impressionistic painting. This is uh, an example uh, by uh, Vincent van Gogh. It's a picture of his bedroom. Notice now that things have slightly changed, 
Okay. Um, notice how the space is a little distorted. The colors are a little weird, right? Um, but there isn't this interest in depicting color and the optical properties of light. There's something else going on here. So we'll start with uh, one post-impressionistic painter, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, so what are you looking at here? Okay, what makes this painting post-impressionistic as opposed to impressionistic? Um, the first thing you want to notice is that there's this very odd use of color, right? And that that use of color is doing something different from what the impressionists were doing with color. The impressionists were using color in a way that would bring out the optical effects and properties of color and light. The post-impressionist, in this case Lautrec, what he's doing is using color now to set the mood of the painting. You see it's a kind of dark, interesting mood, right? So post-impressionists, what they start to do to recognize is that, wait a minute, the impressionists were making use of color uh, in a way which is different from the classical use of color. The classical use of color was just to kind of, you know, paint what you're seeing or to make things look beautiful. The impressionistic use of color was now recognizing that color can be set apart from the form and we can actually do things with color that are not actually seen in the real world. And we can use our imagination, in fact. And so the post-impressions start to use their imagination uh, to exploit the properties of color, but not only color, as we're going to see, but also form as well. Okay, and there's Lautrec himself. So another painting, okay? So notice also that, that interesting use of color here, um, but also notice how the images are becoming a bit more abstract, okay? Notice that the images, in some cases, the woman here, the man there, they're almost two-dimensional, right? And so there isn't this interest on, in painting the form as we see it. And this is going to be important for that movement toward abstractionism, okay? Uh, another one, a lithograph here, so, okay, this is just, notice the interesting relationship between this and the Japanese uh, prints that we saw earlier, right? Okay, Surat. So this is a very interesting painting. What are we looking at here? First of all, the, Surat has moved away from that informal style. So what you want to see is that he actually sat down and he composed this painting and put all the parts together before he actually painted it. So he's not going out anymore and just painting scenes. What else you, do you want to notice is that the forms here are really abstract, right? They're almost, this man here, his hat, right? And these, they're almost tubular, right? The, 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 the scene is almost two-dimensional. And notice also this weird use of color, right? The tiny dots of pure color. Okay, what is that? <clears throat> so, Here's a detail from that painting, from the La Parade, which we just saw. Look, so what happens is Surat discovers this new technique of applying the color. So remember, everybody starts to manipulate color, which is called pointillism. And what he discovers is that you can actually get the same effects from color by putting the color in, in terms of original dots of color on the canvas and kind of mixing them on the canvas as you would get by mixing them beforehand. So just to explain again, what painters normally do is they'll take something, they'll take their colors such as yellow and blue and red and before they paint they'll mix the colors okay on the palette that they have, right? So they'll take yellow and blue and they'll mix it, okay? And they'll get something like, what is that, green? Right? Um, what Surat started to do is rather than mixing it beforehand, he would take something like a yellow dot, right? And he'd put it directly onto the canvas, okay? Or he'd take something, maybe he would mix sometimes, and he would take a blue dot, a red dot, and maybe a green dot. And then what happens is that when you move away, okay, the colors start to mix, and your, your eye mixes the color for you so that he doesn't actually have to mix the colors uh, indirectly, okay? So this becomes pointillism. Now again, notice the emphasis on the use of color here. 
and here's another picture from Surat, uh, Sunday afternoon on the island of Grand Jatte. Imagine how long it must have taken him to paint this. Every single uh, point on that painting has been placed very precisely. And also you have to think about how the color is going to mix in each case. So notice again that use of technique. So what's happening here is the post-impressionists are starting to become interested in how they're painting. Not so much what they're painting, but rather how. So they start to become interested in the method of painting itself, right? And they also start, start to become less interested in painting actual forms as they see them. So you see here the forms, the people, and the trees, and the dogs, they're not very accurate. And you can imagine that Surat could have definitely painted uh, the images accurately uh, given the, the skill and technique with which he applies this. He simply doesn't want to. That's the idea. He wants to produce this effect, this kind of abstracted effect. Right? Now we'll move to Paul Cezanne, a favorite of mine as well. And here we have a still life with uh, the plaster Cupid. So notice here that Cezanne is starting to collapse the space. So in other words, you have this three-dimensional image in which the space there is distorted in the background so that what would be three-dimensional almost comes out as looking kind of a three-dimensional collapsing into two-dimensional space. So he's starting to play around with space and color and manipulate things uh, more and more, right? Okay, here we have another picture by Paul Cezanne. And notice how the forms here are very simplified. The space here is also collapsing. There's this sort of two-dimensionality within three-dimensionality as well, right? And here another great example, okay? The surface is here broken up by flat fields of color, almost like those Japanese prints, but also how the, the, the color itself starts to stand out on its own, right? How the mountain has this kind of dab of color, and the trees this other dab of color, and he starts, and he's very interested in his brush strokes. He's very interested in kind of collapsing space while creating space, using color to create space fields or fields of space, okay? And how the colors are working together along with space to produce a single image, okay? And he's not so much interested in the landscape itself. The landscape becomes more of a context uh, that allows him to kind of manipulate color and form the way he wants to, right? So, 20th century art, in other words, uh, modern art, real modern art, because this is still early modern art, is going to be then rooted in the post-impressionists. So we're going to see someone like Cezanne, a post-impressionist, because of his strange use of space here, he's going to influence something like Cubism. Okay, there's an example of Cubism. Okay, here's another example of Cubism, the very famous painter Pablo Picasso, um, who dabbled with Cubism, he was one of the great ones, but then he moved away from it. But notice how the images are kind of, are being brought out by their geometrical structure, okay? And there's this very interesting play of shapes, there's this kind of use of, of primitive images as well in the painting, and so artists are starting to move in very different directions. But in particular, they're starting to exploit how they're painting, and they're less interested and what they're painting, right? Another example by Picasso. This one shows you that, that cubism even, even more. Uh, and so what we see is this movement toward abstractionism, right? In the modern artists. Okay, Vincent van Gogh. Okay, here we have a self-portrait, another great artist. Okay. Uh, to see some of van Gogh's works, you can go to the uh, museum in Amsterdam uh, in Holland. They have the van Gogh Museum in which they have this many paintings of Van Gogh lined along this corridor that moves all the way upward. It's a very interesting place. If you're ever there, make sure you see that. Uh, go to that museum. So here we have some self-portraits. Okay. Um, an interesting side note, one of the things that painters have always done is painted portraits of themselves. And you see the example of Van Gogh, um, he's painted multiple portraits. One of the reasons for this is that, well, you can, if you're painting yourself, um, it offers a person that you can paint who you know is going to sit there for you. Um, another reason, I think, is perhaps rooted 
and a kind of psychological need to self-evaluate ourselves in a way to show ourselves. And this is expressed even today in the kind of the selfies that we see taken by cell phones. So if you really get down to it, the selfies of today are kind of the, the very, very modern, contemporary ways in which people are trying to express themselves through self-portraiture. So it's very interesting. There's a deep psychology there uh, in terms of you know, self-portraits and these selfies, uh, which is rooted in human history since this portraiture goes all the way back you know, to the times in which uh, artists first started painting. So it's a very interesting psychological thing to notice there. So again, uh, Van Vincent Van Gogh's room, and here what you want to notice is that the color has been deliberately distorted and the space and the depth and the form as well. What Van Gogh is, do is doing here, whether psychological or not, is he's attempting to convey emotional or psychological states. Now, uh, just going back here, I say whether he's attempting to do that or not because, well, you can't say that these artists uh, at the time were completely aware of what it is that they were doing. Now, when we turn to Kandinsky, we'll see that in some ways he was aware. He was an artist apart from other artists. He was a very groundbreaking artist. and In many ways, he was the one who kind of brought artists, along with others, into awareness of what they're doing in the modern age. In, in the case of Van Gogh, we see Van Gogh is a very interesting person. Um, he uh, at some point went kind of insane and he cut off his ear and he sent it to a woman in a box. You'll see here there's a picture of him uh, with his ear cut off, a self-portrait. And indeed he went insane at some point and committed suicide. One of the reasons for this is that a lot of the artists at the time used to drink uh, this terrible drink called absinthe. Uh, you can still buy it today but it's nothing like what it used to be. So absinthe it's just an, uh, it's a liquor, but what they put in it is wormwood, and wormwood is in fact has been discovered to be poisonous uh, if you ha if you drink it or use it at a high level, and so eventually it leads to some form of uh, brain disease. So the artists didn't know this, and they would drink a lot of this. And apparently Van Gogh did drink this, and it did lead to his insanity. So whether or not he knows, you know, what he's doing, and look at this beautiful portrait here. Right? You see how the lines are centering around his head here, his use of lines. He was a brilliant artist, Van Gogh, and actually in his time he was completely unknown and he died in poverty, depression, and despair. Today his artists, you know, his paintings can go for millions of dollars each. Kind of unfair. Okay, so you see that picture in the bedroom. Um, here's another one, The Starry Night, right? And kind of you see the swirls here they're kind of conveying something of Van Gogh's inner felt experience. When we look at later uh, painting, when we start talking about psychoanalysis and Viktor Frankl and Freud, we're going to see surrealism, which will kind of bring out the subconsciousness even more directly. Okay, So here we see something like that within these post-impressionistic painters here, Van Gogh. And again, look, look at the forms here. Okay, They're kind of really distorted, really simplified, you know, the images, and yet if you see this painting, an actual person, you see it's a beautiful painting. Uh, and, so, and especially if you consider the time in which this has been done, this is groundbreaking. To do something like that today, maybe it wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't kind of look at it twice. You'd say, oh, it's a nice picture. But at that time, to see a work like that, it's completely, I mean, completely original. Just nothing like that existed at the time. So you can only imagine, you know, the kind of artistic genius that Van Gogh had, this kind of very, you know, sensitive, very humble, and also kind of a depressed individual. And so he just kind of painted his emotions and kind of just allowed his emotions to create a new visual world which no one had really created before. And so Van Gogh would eventually influence later sort of more modern art, uh, which is called Expressionism. Here we have Edvard Munch, The Scream should be famous, maybe most of you know that. Look at the, the work there, the expressionistic work, that sort of manip manipulation of color, space, form, the images, and it expresses something very powerful, right? Some kind of angst or anxiety or terror, right? 
So another great artist, Paul Gauguin, actually Gauguin and Van Gogh were friends and they lived together for some time. Uh, eventually uh, Gauguin left France and he moved to Tahiti where he painted the local natives and he spent some time there. And you'll see that his paintings are actually influenced by this. Uh, Gauguin is one of the artists that I really love. If you ever have time, take a look at some of his works. If you ever get the opportunity to see his works in the museum, you should do so. This is the vision after the sermon. The sermon. Uh, no, notice this large field of, of color here and how the space is being distorted and how the images themselves are being reduced. There's a power and intensity to the use of his color here. He's bringing something to the, to the fore here within this example of this, of this man wrestling with the angel. Right. Here's another example, the yellow Christ. Right. So again, that simplification of form, the collapse of space, that movement toward abstractionism is what we're seeing here. Right. Okay. And this, I think, work, this work in particular, really shows that progression into abstractionism. The kind of the two fields of color and just the simplified form, okay, really simplified here. It seems like a snake or something, right? And so what is he expressing here? Well, it's more the case that he's not trying to express something like a physical form, oh, it's a man with a snake. He's trying to express something which is kind of, which lacks a rational, let's say, idea to it. It's something more emotional, expressive, artistic. It's the visual image itself that he, he wants to convey something in the fields of color and space that you're looking at, right? So we have also the use of symbolism there too with the snake, okay? And here's Paul Gauguin again, where do we come from? Uh, what are we, where are we going? Here, a picture of the natives there. Okay, so we see that Gauguin will influence the later works of Fauvism there. Henri Matisse was a later modern Fauvist painter Jacob wrestling. That's it, Jacob with the angel. There's what we saw. Um, and notice here with Fauvism, this interest in color, right? And this kind of deliberate use of fields of color, okay? Another example of Henri Matisse, the dance, 1910. So it's very similar to what we saw with Gauguin, that reduction of space and color and form. And here, the joy of life, this kind of weird, kind of erotic painting, but this beautiful use of color which Matisse had. He was very gifted in his use of color. Okay, so part two, and we're going to look at Kandinsky and abstract art. Um, so again, in discussing Kandinsky, okay, I'm going to kind of uh, minimalize what I say here, and when you go and do the essays and when you do the reading questions, etc., you're going to have more contact um, with Kandinsky's work you'll get more deeply involved in it, okay? So make sure you read that. So Vasily Kandinsky, very interesting person. He was 1864 to 1966, 1944. He is considered one of the main founders of modern art. Okay, you can think of Pablo Picasso as another one. Uh, he's born in Moscow, and he was a lecturer at the University of Moscow. Um, I haven't written it here, but I believe he was a lecturer of law, or political science, um, interestingly, right before he received his final professorship, at 30 years old, he, he said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. And really, without any formal experience, he completely quit his job. He left Moscow, he moved to Germany, to Munich, and he went there to study painting. Okay, so imagine, you know, what kind of changes he must have undergone to finally say, you know what, I just don't want to do this anymore. And he completely abandoned his previous career and really, without having much experience, became one of the founding artists of the modern era. So, really, who can tell you what to do in life, right? If you truly have a passion for something, well, perhaps you should pursue it. You know, there are examples in history of people who have done so and become extremely successful in that change. Um, in, uh, in Germany, he there founded uh, the their Blaue Reiter, which is called the Blue Reiter, together with a, a friend, and 1911. And this was really the seminal group in 20th century art, and it emphasized inner expression of self over style, and it sought the spiritual or dematerialization of art. 
Now it's kind of interesting when you look at how he formed that group because it's kind of similar to what we saw with the fountain and Duchamp. Uh, so what happened is that he was in a, another group at the time and he formed a previous group and they also had an art exhibit and he submitted this painting, The Blue Rider, which we'll see in a moment, and the group said, you know what, this painting does not jive with our style. And so although he was a founding uh, member of the group, they rejected his painting. And you can imagine, he said, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, why should I have to conform to this style? The whole point of art is to explore new styles. And so he left the group uh, with his friend, with a friend of his, and he formed this new group, the Blue Rider. And in fact, the old group kind of just, you know, fell into historical, into, the, into history, in historical nothingness. And the Blue Rider, his group, became this kind of seminal group, which led to 20th century abstract art. And so it becomes a time of uh, real exploration and development. And during that time, Kandinsky makes the kind of final leaps into abstract art. He publishes his great work on the spiritual and art. And there's other, other works as well you, you can read if you're interested. Point, Line to Plane, for example, is another one which he discusses the nature of drawing and, and drafting. And he presents his theory of abstractionism or non-objective art. Okay. So just a point here, the dematerialization of art. That term which he does use, what he means by that is art focusing less on painting images that we kind of are, are all, uh, that we all recognize, like trees and horses and people and landscapes, and instead focusing more on the spiritual. And by the spiritual, he means kind of the expressive nature of what we are. So kind of focusing on expressing ourselves in art rather than just kind of using images to do so, right? So, um, just sorry, as a final point, one of the analogies here you can think of is music, and he kind of uses the analogy uh, within his text. And because you can ask musicians, right? Well, they play, they make music, they create music, okay? And you don't expect a musician's music to sound like real things. So you wouldn't want to listen to music that sounds like goats and pigs howling and wind, right, and, and rain. That can be interesting, but in general, you know, that's not what we look for in music. And so the question is, when we're looking at art, why is it that we expect artists to paint pictures of things that we're familiar with, goats and pigs and landscapes and trees, right? Well, like music, it seems that art has a more abstract function, that artists aren't, that the artist, true artists, are not trying to depict the forms that we see and know. They're trying to depict a kind of inner life or spirit of the artist, the artist's ideas, their passions, their emotions, okay? And once this recognition dawns on artists, okay, during the early modern and modern age, art kind of frees itself so that something like Duchamp's The Fountain starts to make sense a little bit because you could say, well, what Duchamp is doing there is expressing something, and it is, he's expressing something about the nature of art itself, which we could talk about later on. So within uh, Kandinsky's work, which I'll kind of summarize in brief, he makes a few distinctions which are going to be significant that I want to point out. Um, he makes a distinction between what he calls imitative versus epical art. Okay, so what is imitative art? Well, I think you can all think about it uh, and recognize what that is. It's art that just kind of imitates art that we already know. So you can think of a co somebody copying a picture that they see. Um, inevitably, uh, that type of art fails to really be genuine art. And you can say, well, why does it fail? And the reason because it's, it's just an imitation. There's nothing original within the, that, that work of art. And so that points to the fact that original art, genuine art, finds some origin within the artist as a kind of creative origin, a cr creative originality within the artist. Somehow that is what makes art for Kandinsky. Okay? Now, uh, he, he also points to epical art, and he says that epical art is the genuine art of the age, the art of the epoch, right? That historical time in which we live. And so what is epical art? Well, the way to think about it 
is, again, you can look at music. If you look at the music of the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, right? Well, someone can come out today, and they can make a song, and you can say, well, that sounds like something you would have heard in the 60s, okay, or the 50s, and you can say, well, it's, it's good, you know, but it's just kind of imitating it, right? And then somebody can come out in 2016, and they can produce a, a, a track or a song, and you can say, wow, that I've never heard anything like that before. It's something so new. In a way, you can say that is kind of the art of the age. It's a new art. It's a completely creative art. Now, there can be a, a genuine revival of images of the past, and this applies to music as well. So somebody could indeed create something like um, a song which sound has sounds that are, are similar to sounds in the past, maybe something like blues or something like jazz. Think of Amy Winehouse. And her music was very jazzy, and yet it was very novel. And so it's not so much an imitation in that case because they're, they're kind of, there's, they have a feel for that past, a sympathy toward that past sound or image. And so in, in that revival, they make it their own. Now, when we looked at neoclassicism, which was the revival of the classical art of ancient Greece, we see that there is this kind of genuine revival in neoclassicism. They're not just imitating the classical Greek artists, they're making it their own, so it's not quite imitative. Okay? Of course, the distinctions here can sometimes be difficult to recognize. Okay? Um, so let's move on. Now, another point that Kandinsky talks about is how the, our time moves historically and how we become more, uh, let's say, more uh, turn toward a specific kind of art, how an art appeals to us within a certain age. And so he makes kind of three distinctions, which uh, in his book they're not quite discussed as this, but I'm going to kind of summarize it this way. And the first is popular art, all right? Now you can think of this in terms of art, in terms of music. Popular art is the art of the masses. In other words, it's the art or the music which just suddenly everybody likes and just as suddenly the, or the next day, no one likes it or everyone has forgotten it. Okay, So it's popular during its time and it passes away quickly. Now, in a, in a way, it could be the art of its age, but it because it has lasting force and power, it really lacks that capacity to kind of become art in a more fundamental way. Okay, Notice how the imitative art is on the bottom of this triangle. And so what this triangle represents is the present age, and this would be kind of the present, 2016, okay? And what we have in 2016, all of this is 2016, is we have popular art, we have imitative art, and we have epical art, or genius. Now, what we want to notice here is that as time moves, okay, what's going to happen is that the popular art is going to fall into the past, the imitative art is going to become more popular, and eventually even the art of the genius is going to become popular. So that, and the reason for this is that you can think about this, that <coughs> most geniuses, artistic geniuses, are really not appreciated in their own time. We can think of, for example, Vincent van Gogh. During his time, he was, he was completely unknown, and it would only be much later on that Vincent van Gogh would become popular. And so what the triangle here is trying to show, what, what Kandinsky is trying to show, is that as time moves on, the present age will begin to, in, at, at a later time, will start to appreciate the, the, the artistic genius of someone who actually created their art during that time. So the way you want to think about it is that at this point right now, people, most people are just kind of interested in popular art. Maybe in 2030, people will finally start to look at an artist who created great art or music in 2016, you see? But of course, in 2030, there's also going to be popular artists who are going to be very popular, and there will be geniuses in 2030 who will not be appreciated maybe until 20 years later, okay? And so this is what we have, that breakdown there. We have popular art, the art of the masses. The imitative art is kind of the art of the schools, kind of the academic art, the art that really doesn't strike any genuine note. And the epical art is kind of the art of the genius, the art that breaks from the norms and standards of art. And of course, that can apply to anyone, whether they're in the, in the academia or not. It's just, this, these are just kind of formal distinctions. 
And generally, this type of art is not going to be appreciated during its time just because it takes time to acquire a certain taste. With genius and epical art, what you have is new sounds, new types of pictures, new images, new ways of doing art. And when you first encounter that, like a new food, many times it just takes some time, or a new song, right? It takes some time to get used to it, right? Because it's so new. Okay? And it's generally not appreciated in its time, this epical art, but is appreciated later on. So abstractionism then. So that movement to abstractionism that we've been talking about, what abstractionism is fundamentally in modern art, it's the recognition that art can transcend the standard and norms of expression that was used in the past. And so what that meant for the modern artists is that, well, we don't need to use color, form, and space just to represent actual things that we can see. We, need, we can use color, form, and space to represent things that, well, that we can't see, or things that we feel, or things that we desire, or things that we think, like concepts. I want to express a concept, for example, a concept of God, or a concept of a triangle. How would I express that concept, right? Or how I feel about that concept. See, that would be abstract art. So here with abstractionism, there's this emphasis, and of course Kandinsky will talk about this in the work, of the expression of the human spirit and the intention, what the artist is trying to do is ideas and feelings becomes first and foremost. And so uh, here's that remark I made earlier. We don't demand that musicians make their music sound like natural things. And similarly, artistic feelings and thoughts do not need to be expressed in terms of natural forms. So, you know, when I'm thinking about doing art or expressing myself, it's not like I want to paint people because of that, right? One doesn't always want to just paint people because one has an artistic feeling. Maybe one wants to part, paint something else, something very, something that doesn't have a particular form to it. Maybe one feels angry, and so one, one wants to depict that, ang that anger, you see? So does that mean I have to now paint a picture of a war or a confrontation? You could, but notice even there, that picture of confrontation, the actual events are not really important. It's what's happening. It's the idea behind it. So that shows us that abstractionism is even part of the ancient works of art that were depicting actual forms, that it wasn't the actual forms themselves in general that's meaningful. It's what's behind the intention of the artist and the society that produced that art, which is meaningful. Okay, so abstractionism itself here defined is a kind of deconstruction of form coupled with emphasis upon portraying the ideas, feeling concepts of the artist. Okay, now, what I want to look at here before I end the lesson is just kind of the evolution of Kandinsky's uh, artistic work uh, and a short evolution and how he proceeds into abstractionism. So what we see here is that original painting which he submitted, which was rejected by his initial group, which is the Blue Rider, and this is the painting that he uses that becomes the name for his new group, the Blue Rider, which then becomes that kind of very influential group of artists that kind of form the foundations of abstractionism. So notice here that this work, it looks very much like impressionism, expressionism in some way, right? So there's that abstractionist feel in the expressionist, but it's not quite at the level of that real abstract art that we're going to see in a bit. But still, Kandinsky's starting to think this way, starting to think along the lines of abstractionism. Um, here we have the cow. Now, look on the bottom there. I say, don't look for a cow. Why? Because that's not the point. The point is not to see the image. It's kind of to see the idea. And probably the word cow was given to the painting after he painted it. He probably didn't even think about a cow until afterwards. Then somebody said, hey, it looks like a cow. And so he said, well, I'll give it the name of the cow. So the point here is that we're not looking for an image. We're looking, for, we're looking at the way in which space and color is being used together with, with forms, a collapse of form, to produce an entire aesthetic effect. Now, one of the points that you want to keep in mind uh, when you look at even abstract art is that although abstract art breaks away from the norms of uh, painting in the sense of painting, you know, actual forms, and instead focuses on abstract ideas and, and collapse of space and form and color, the abstract artists of the early modern era, here you see 1910 this was painted, are still working within the confines 
of the classical norms of beauty and the way and the types of art and media to be used. So this will be important because later on we'll talk a bit about some postmodern art, for example, the fountain which we saw, which kind of is at the beginning of that. Because with the postmodern arts artists, they're gonna break away from the whole tradition of art and really the aesthetic of art, which the modern artists here, the abstractionists, are still retaining. Why? Because the picture is still a beautiful painting in many ways, right? Uh, here's another work of Kandinsky, and notice that this is really moving into abstractionism. There's almost a play with cubism here, and that play of color. And notice how the images are not, they're kind of, there's an images that come out of the canvas, and uh, images that you kind of seem to recognize, but then you can't quite recognize them, right? Uh, here's another one, and here he's starting in 1920 to really master his approach. He's starting to deliberately convey his concepts, his ideas, in ways which are becoming masterfully depicting them, right? And here we have Vasily Kandinsky again, the circles in a circle, he starts to emphasize, okay, these kind of almost geometric but more flowing figures and forms.